Euh, merci au Musée de la Chasse et de la Nature de nous recevoir. Euh, qui sont nos voisins également de Palier, euh, 79, 19 rue des Archives, puisque leur administration est à côté de chez nous. Donc on est très amis avec eux et on, on aime beaucoup ce musée, pour ceux qui ne le connaîtraient pas, euh, là-haut. Now I'm, I'm going to turn to English. I'm sorry for you. Uh, thank you very much for this museum to welcome us. I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting museum for those of you that don't know it. Uh, you should sometime pay the time of the visit upstairs. Um, it's a museum that about, it's about hunting and nature, but they also very regularly invite contemporary artists or even photographers. Sophie Carl had a very successful show here um, when they have to do with nature and eventually hunting. Um, so we uh, we're happy to be here. We're happy to be here with Martin. That um, in a very very busy week, as he always has. Um, as uh, chosen to give us uh, one night time with you, we were going to have. A, I have some questions that we've been friends for the past 40 years. I still have some questions to ask him, and it's always a chance to have a public so you can uh, channel the questions somehow through you to him. Um, things you don't always do every day, so it's always a pleasure to to be able to um, raise the, the big issues here on stage. Um, this, me this meeting occurs because we have the um, exhibition at the Cartier-Bresson Foundation um, called Reconciliation, as you can see behind me, uh, between Henri Cartier-Bresson and Martin Parr. Um, probably we could have put an um, interrogation point after Reconciliation um, because, uh, again, last night I was um, in a dinner and um, uh, good old friends came to me one after the other one say, how can you think they could either ev ever reconciliate? Um, for me, it's a, it's not a question for a long time, um, but Martin will explain his point of view about this. Um, but the show probably give us some clues to where the common ground is more than one would think before that show. And um, that show um, all started because we found an incredible treasure, which was unknown from the foundation, or at least left aside, which is a film uh, where Catherine Besson was assigned in 1962 to take pictures in the north of England of English people at work and on the beach when they go for leisure um, in similar places where uh, Martin Parr went in 1985, which ended up in the book in 1986, called The Last Resort. I had the chance at the time to show this work in Arles, which was probably one of the first times in Europe. Um, and that's also when the controversy about the work of Martin started. Uh, for those that didn't pay the attention to what was there growing as a real vision, of where photography should go and what the role of photography is. And this is maybe what we're going to um, investigate uh, this morning. So the show is over there. Uh, we're going to have a 40 minutes talk. Then I'll give the floor to any of you that has questions. And then if you're interested, um, we, can, uh, we will move to the Cathy Wesson Foundation where Martin will uh, be available for signing books. If anyone wants to um, find books, we have a, a bookstore there, obviously, especially with the, um, the the catalog of the show, which is here, which has two entries, The English by Martin Parr, Les Anglais, or Les Anglais, <laughs> uh, by Henri Cartier-Bresson. Um, and we meet halfway. And au milieu, halfway, you have the two factors that explain the origin of the um, controversy. Um, anyway, the, the, the controversy started, Martin, when you um, were already a, a photographer going up in his fame and in his work. Very, um, you, you had various projects behind you. There was a, the last resort. There was a cost of living. There was sign of the times. All these dealing with the way of life of English people in your kind of a direct way and very uh, intrusive way, and but also always interacting with the people in a very kind um, and, and gentle way. Um, 
what what came to your mind um, to have the, the will to join Magnum? Because that was the time we're back in 1989. Because um, Martin applied for Magnum in 1989 and finally entered Magnum five years later. Usually, a photographer is four years purgatory for Magnum. He got five, um, and and at the time. The market of photography was starting to build itself, um, and some photographers um, would more choose to go into galleries than to go in a photo agency. What came to your mind, Martin? Uh, I think I wanted to join Magnum because uh, I, I liked uh, the idea of a cooperative. I knew quite a few photographers in Magnum, especially the English ones like David Hearn, uh, Crystal Perkins. And I just liked the idea of having someone looking after my licensing, getting the pictures out. Uh, it's not something that I particularly was good at. I didn't have the contacts. And also, you know, I wanted to work for magazines. I just liked the idea of getting the work out through different platforms to many more people than I would have done had I not joined Magnum. So that's the thing that motivated me. And uh, as you well know, the, uh, the first application was 89. And from the word go, uh, as you've indicated, that the work caused a lot of controversy within Magnum. There is a core of people who are led by Philip Jones Griffiths, the esteemed... Uh, an English photographer himself, though uh, the Welsh, English photographers... Welsh. Welsh. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Fortunately, not Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was led by him. And, uh, you, you know, you, it's difficult to underestimate how fierce his criticism was. He called me a fascist. He called me, you know, part of Mrs. Thatcher's band. I mean, he found the worst insults possible to sort of throw at me. And then, uh, of well, course... He usually was very funny, but I mean... Uh, when he, he was a very funny he guy. He was devastating and, as well, yeah. And, and a very good photographer. Interestingly, uh, in the first, say, 12 years of my career, I worked in black and white. Because if you're a photographer in the early 70s, that's really what you did. You know, the, the photography wasn't really the colour domain. You know, if you're a colour photographer, you were doing advertising or family snaps. And I did actually a workshop with Philip Jones Griffiths, maybe in you know, 1975, something like that. And we got on extremely well. This is when I was doing my black and white work. You were we, doing the workshop as a photographer? Or yes, I was like an assistant photographer. Okay. He was the sort of lead guy because I wasn't so well known then. But the irony is that we got on extremely well. So it wasn't actually our inability to talk and communicate to each other. Although after I tried to join Magnum, he never spoke to me again. You know, he just avoided me. And uh, yes, in a sense, I sort of look back at all this now, uh, and uh, you know, I think uh, the controversy that this work, you know, basically uh, generated is not a bad thing, uh, because probably still now the, the work that I did in, you know, it was published in '86, is probably still my most popular uh, body of work. The Last Resort. That's right. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you, you told me that you're saying 2,000 copies a year of that book. I mean, when, when I started in photography, which is more or less at that time in the <coughs> '80s. Um, 2,000 copies what was a, a book would sell over two years for famous photographers. And, and you're still saying 2,000 copies of a one a book out of the 120 you, you published? <laughs> That's right. It's quite fascinating. Yeah. No, yeah. no, I'm, I'm a very promiscuous photographer. I accept that. Uh, but yeah, uh, and it's on its seventh edition or something like that. We just keep reprinting it and reprinting it. So it, it's, like a, it's better than a pension, really, because it keeps on going. And it'll actually generate income when I'm dead, which is quite nice to think. Because, you know, I too, like uh, County Bresson, have a foundation and we need to think about how to fund this and, and keep it going after my demise. We'll, we'll come to the foundation <laughs> later as come well. Come to my death later, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> There's a, uh, actually, um, so you entered Magnum, you became a, a heavy contributor to Magnum because Magnum photographers have to give part of what they earn to get... The, the tool, Magnum is a tool. People have a lot of fantasy about Magnum, but it's actually a working tool. Um, so you, you became a heavy contributor for Magnum, um, along with Cartier Besson, I must say. Um, and th th more than Philip John Griffiths. M much more probably. than Philip, yes. That, that gives me some <laughs> satisfaction. You, you, uh, and then you became a president of Magnum and a very influential one to your brother photographers. So um, you, you're, f you're fully into the, the Magnum now. What, what is your. Uh, the conclusion of your experience after now being 30 years at Magnum, I mean, what did it bring to you? And uh, is that, was that a mistake or for, for your career, if that is a good word? No, no, it, it was be, it's been a fantastically beneficial uh, relationship that I've had. Um, you know, getting the work out, the licensing. You know, 
uh, I'm the sort of top licensor because people like, you know, I make colorful, bright, brash pictures and, you know, most of us don't have much taste and therefore they're very appealing. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's the secret why, you know, Japanese companies want my images on T-shirts and, uh, you know, someone from America say, we'll put your image on a bag. And at the Do foundation... Do you have a cafe in Japan like Chris Marker <laughs> and La Jetée? Oh, no, not yet. <laughs> not, no, not yet. But, oh, um, wow. We should do it in Paris. OK. Uh, yeah. Well, when you retire, you can uh, organise that for me. Well, that's two weeks from now. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have a deal. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, and I like the idea of photography being high and low culture. You know, I have pictures in the Tate. I have pictures in the Museum of Modern Art. But I like the fact you can print a zine, say, on the cheapest, trashiest paper, and it still functions as an image. So that whole promiscuity, the fact that photography is high and low culture, really appeals to me. And Magnum can help me uh, you know, achieve that, because I haven't got the time to sort of be dealing with someone in Russia or wherever and working out what the fee would be for that uh, licensing uh, question. I remember um, when we were young, um, uh, th one of the first things we did, uh, that was the beginning of printing on, on large formats and these kind of things, that uh, you did a flower show project and you wrapped up uh, a bank uh, main office with flowers by you. Oh yes, yeah. it was, I think it was a total failure. I think the technique mm -hmm. wasn't good enough at the time, but um, we could do it again. Uh, anyway, the um, you, you, you mentioned the last resort book. I mean, I was... One of the things that struck me when I saw um, w The Last Resort come, come out is um, we were at the time in a kind of um, seek for recognition of photography by the institutions. Uh, when publishers would do photography, they would, would do the, um, pages white and in the middle a photograph framed by white, like if it was a frame itself. Uh, there was something a bit heavy and sort of a... They wanted to be classic. I mean, Fotafi wanted to be sort of a uh, looking alike uh, the ar the art as you see it in general in catalogs. Um, when you did the last resort, it was um, a soft cover book, not a hard cover book, and you you left a lot of space to the graphic designer. I mean, um, you even gave him the cover of your book, which I admired a lot. Um, and within the book, we even had some little pink and yellow and bluish uh, um, design in it facing your pictures. I love that. I, I thought it was very smart. You also had uh, already postcards um, in the last resort book within the text uh, illustrating what the, the, the beach of New Brighton was. Um, but when you republished the seven times, mm -hmm. the last resort, you're now um, in a much more conventional layout. How come? It's um, a hardcover, there's a picture on the cover, it's actually the picture that we used in 1986 for our workshops in all. There's the kids licking uh, ice creams. And, and then y you, um, you, you don't have a little graphic designs in it. And why did you um, I guess cut back on this? I mean, the, the, the colorful design was really part of the sort of the time, you know, it's, it's 80s graphics. Uh, so I quite like the idea of just updating it. I mean, I, there are plenty of books that I have made still that have interesting production ideas within them. So I think we just wanted to have something, a new text, which explained how the history of The Last Resort had been uh, viewed by the, the photographic culture, uh, and just to do a sort of classical design. Uh, can I just answer the other question we didn't uh, deal with? I think, uh, in terms of Magnum, um, I think what, one of the things that really happened after my entry is it, it, you know, it, it meant that different photographers could join Magnum. So it is a, a time when you didn't just have the humanistic uh, photojournalist, which is a traditional sort of uh, ground for Magnum photographers. You know, you had people like Alice Soth, Antoine Dagatar, you know, a new generation of documentary photographers. They're still interested in telling stories about their rendition of the world and how they see it. Uh, but the way they do it is really sort of uh, expanded. And I think if that hadn't happened, you know, like all the other agencies, uh, you know, we wouldn't still be there. Because when you look at the, the death of the agencies that relied on the magazine market, uh, we realize that uh, they've all gone. You know, it's very difficult to survive. You can't live off magazine markets alone. And even Magnum, you know, we still obviously do editorial, but it's the digital department with things like the square print sale that has actually helped Magnum to still be here and survive. So I'm sorry about that. I forgot to answer that one before. I guess we could have two hours about Magnum, <laughs> the two of us, but I mean, this is not uh, exactly the yeah. point. But 
going, going back to book publishing, I mean, you've, you've published, I mentioned before, you said, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't even seem sure of how many books you have published. You no, said no, I must count them sometime, yeah. It, it's on my site, so if anyone's interested, you know, we show all the books, although we're about three months late in uploading. And quite a few interesting films as well. Um, but, I mean, w w th th there are books of various categories, because I've seen you producing books incredibly quickly mm -hmm. and some are and, and at the same time you were mentioning that there was only one retrospective book which is the fine and big book though this came out more than 10 years ago so um how come we, we don't have more transversal books about your work which i think is would be very interesting because what people you know wh when you know one of your works like last resort which has uh, been seen by so many people we can have one idea of of what your interest in photography is, where actually I think it's, it has many, many forms. So um, do you think that will be the last uh, retrospective book you will do? No, I think, uh, you know, Fiden will eventually update it. I mean, that's really their obligation, because if they don't, uh, maybe in a couple of years' time, I'll think it's time to sort of really do the update. And if they don't, then I can go to another publisher. But in the meantime, I mean, we still have uh, the, the expanded edition is is in your shop. It's big and pink and yellow. You know, it's brash and bright, like all things that I enjoy, as you know. Absolutely. Yeah, do, do, do you, um, I mean, sometimes um, some people, some orthodox people in photography business think that you're, you're doing book-like products. One is about uh, people in their cars. One is about, you know, Paris with this map of Paris kind of cover. Um, you know, it, it seems like you could produce a book by going back to your archive and, and putting pictures together that not necessarily had to do it in the first place and that you're producing a, a product and not necessarily a, f a photographer's book. What's your, what is your relationship to well, the, the books? You know, one of the, I, mean, I guess my main motivation in my last 50 years is really to sort of build up this archive, particularly about the United Kingdom, that sort of tell us about my relationship to the country how I've observed it, how thing, how society has changed. And because I have, say, like 52,000 um, high-res images on the Magnum site, all keyworded, all ready to download, it means if you say to me tomorrow, I'm doing a show on dogs, have you got 50 pictures, I'll be able to give them to you. Because I just like photographing. I oh, go you out want to, all you the want time. to challenge Elliot Erwitt. <laughs> 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 you should do that. Yes. So, you know, the archive that has built up on the Magnum site is, is really, you know, perhaps the most important thing. And uh, I, there's still aspects of British society that I've yet to explore. But uh, I think most of the things, most different classes, you know, I've done the working class, middle class, of which I'm a, you know, obviously a member, the upper classes, I've done, uh, you know, the traditions in the city of London, which are very archaic. Uh, so I, I'm constantly you did, looking you did for... You deco as well? Sorry? You did deco as well? Deco. De de decorating. I mean, uh, oh, the, yes. the inside yeah, of yeah. People, people's That's home, right. yeah? People's Sign relationship to their homes. Yeah and indeed people's relationship to their cars. So yes, uh, it, it's very important to me to think of my legacy as being this archive, uh, which will be you know, accessible through Magnum, of course, and for people to come and do research at the Martin Parr Foundation. But you say it's all about England. It's actually not all about England, because um, th there's that project about the commuters in Japan yeah. that sleep on the subway. There's a project about tourism, mass tourism around the world, which are people from all the, over the world that go uh, for um, all this tourist experience that we um, have seen growing since the past 20 years. So it's not just about no, England. No, it's not. I mean, it's a global thing, but I guess there are more British pictures than anything else. There's maybe half the, uh, half the um, archive is from Britain and the rest is from the rest of the world. But, you know, I've been very lucky that photography has taken me to, you know, all the, you know, many, virtually every country in the world. It's been a fantastic experience. And people pay you to do this. And it's, I still have to kick myself, think, what a privileged life I lead. You know, I'm doing my hobby and people pay me to do it. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, do, you, um, do you wait for these assignments nowadays to, <laughs> to, to, uh, to go on, on the work? Because you're so busy by, yeah. you know, doing books, taking care of your foundation for other British photographers. Uh, doing these books of books that have been incredibly successful and interesting. And for those that don't know what it is, it's the history of books um, through a selection of books that Martin collected 
and then gathered and, and edited into a big book that tells you the three history books, of Three books. volumes, in fact. Yeah, three volumes about the general story, plus the Chinese one, mm -hmm. uh, plus a Latino one you took mm -hmm. part as well in. So this is five of them, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, you're incredibly busy. I mean, mm -hmm. wh now when you take pictures, is that when you get an assignment or you're still um, self-motivated by something? Or are you blasé? Uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, I knew I was going to ask that. I have, uh, <laughs> I have my loma, which is a form of cancer that slowed me down a bit, but I can still go out and photograph. And the summer, you know, like June, July, August, I really reserve for photographing in the UK. And the rest of the time, I'm happy to do uh, consignments and and projects. I mean, I don't get as many uh, magazine assignments as I did before because well, they don't the, the magazine so market so. has declined. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I've just spent a week in Malaga, which is a cultural commission uh, for a museum in Malaga, where I'll be having a show next February. So it gives me a chance to, you know, with a good person who, who does the production, you can do an incredible amount of work in a week, which is what I, that's the amount of time I spent there. What is the part of print sales in your activity now these days? Yeah. I were in Pi Photo days. I mean, is print sales big for you? It's, it is pretty good, I have to admit. You know, the, the pitch I have... I don't know if anyone has seen it of the Queen from behind with her hat. Love it. You know, this is basically sold out. Sorry, I, I brought Yusuf Karsh picture because I, <laughs> I, you were there, but I mean, you should have brought yours. I don't have it. So, But yeah, that's, that's done very well here at uh, Parry Photo. Uh, so yeah, it's an important part of my Do income. you number your pictures? Yes, they, they're editioned after uh, 1989. The good thing about that is that the last resort is not editioned, which means I can keep churning out prints and selling them. I, I don't know how many prints I've done right. of the last resort in the, in the small size. It, it's a lot. Okay. Very and good. the black and white weren't editioned either. So because I was going into that sort of market of being represented by galleries, uh, it became quite important to do the editioning. So we started out with uh, one of 25, and now it's one of 10 with uh, one of five of the bigger print. Coming back to your uh, relationship with Henri Cartier-Bresson, mm -hmm. um, can you define it? I mean, the, the story of the, the, this uh, violent exchange when the tourism show was in Paris and we were trying to enter Magnum is now the purpose of this show, so I guess everyone knows it or will see the show later. But um, well, on the long term, what was your relationship with Henri Cartier-Bresson? I mean, it, it was fine. I mean, I remember being influenced by him when I was a teenager. He had an exhibition in London in 1969, which I, I really enjoyed. And, uh, you know, I, of course you admire his ability to compose and the poetry that he can uh, pr provide in images. So when I joined Magnum, you know, we would say hello and everything. Um, it wasn't, uh, he wasn't super friendly, but it was respectful. And I'd always bring in um, books for him to sign. I got him to sign my copy of the Decisive Moment, for example. Uh, and then after the, uh, you know, the argument or the spat, whatever you want to call it, and the, the efforts of Martine Frank to bring me round and have the lunch, uh, we became a bit more friendly, in fact. So uh, I guess in the end, he accepted the fact that the members had voted for me to be part of Magnum, and, and he has to respect that. You know, it's like a democracy. We have to really abide by what the democracy tells us, both in politics and in joining Magnum. <laughs> very good. Um, Magnum is very much a political uh, arena in its, uh, in its own right. Um, do, do you think the, um, your work is close enough that we can talk about a reconciliation or does that show shows that your work isn't really totally different because the, the, the interesting thing with that show is it's like a play when you um when you have a play and two directors that are going to put the, the play on stage with two different settings two different casting and and then they um the the, the result is actually though the text is the same though the situations are the same that you get two very different shows. Um, how close, how far do you think, and how do, would you define it from Henri's work and your work? Well, I was quite surprised when I finally saw the exhibition up uh, to see the similarities of, uh, of our approach and techniques and, and the type of subject matter that we'd be interested in. And basically, it was exactly the same. Uh, and that is almost worrying, really. But, and I can see him... You know, he does his factory pictures. I can just see him walking around, and then there's someone with a hairnet on, which people used to wear back in the 60s, uh, you know, getting the uh, hair in your rollers, you know, ready for the evening when you go out for a dance or whatever. And uh, there'd be a picture of Elvis up on the wall. Of course, he would hone in on that. 
with the woman, you know, basically the relationship. Yeah, Bon Jovi, not Elvis. Uh, bon Jovi. On your, well, there on is your own picture. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I can see him. I can literally see, I understand exactly what he's doing when he's walking around. I do the same when he goes to Blackpool. I can see exactly why he's chosen certain things. You know, he's found things on the beach, uh, the donkeys, the ice cream cart, the tea cart. And you can see he's playing with the relationship. So the similarities between us in, uh, in terms of photography approach were surprisingly similar. I mean, almost worryingly so. Did you well, find for, that for, a surprise? For, for, fortunately, you were 11 when the film was broadcasted <laughs> in England, so <laughs> otherwise we it. could have thought that you were inspired yeah. to the extent that you did the same thing. But I mean, uh, you, and let me, you uh, never I, knew about that film, right? Let me tell you why I love Seaside Resort so much, because my parents were bird watchers, and, and therefore all our outings and all our holidays were to look, at, look for birds. Okay, so when we went to the seaside, we go to some boggy marsh where you'd find waders, and uh, I never got to a seaside resort. So basically, for the rest of my life, I've been trying to catch up with what I missed out in terms of my childhood. That's why I love uh, the beach so much. I can't keep away because I was deprived of it uh, during my childhood. That was very sad. It's sort of sad, but it's interesting. You know, it's a it, it's a pure motive. You know, and that's why, like a jackdaw being attracted to gold beads you know that's why i can't help myself what even now i i can't get over that what did your parents think of your very ironic work as a <laughs> photographer well they were to their credit very supportive of my career so i i have no complaints uh, about that but um that's why i love beaches and i've always used the beach that i did a book about four years ago called beach therapy excuse the pun <laughs> and there i explained that every time i i had a new camera or a new uh, you know, a new way of exploring. I would go to the beach first as my laboratory, if you like. So when I had a macro lens with a ring flash, I went to the beach and photographed people very close up. Uh, when I had the first uh, digital camera, I came back a bit. And then more recently, I've experimented with what's possible with a telephoto lens looking at the beach. So I've always used it as a way of exploring uh, different ways and different techniques. And it's always exciting when you have a new, a new camera, a new format, a new way of working. Uh, to see what you can come up with, because the danger is that you know, with someone like me, you just re you basically re you rely on your past uh, palette, your past uh, sort of ways of working, and you know you're not taking risks. So I think that's always helped me to sort of try and keep fresh and keep doing different and new things. Well, I think this is very true. I mean, there's always a moment when you talk to photographers; they talk about techniques. Um, that was the chapter. Um, but I mean, the, the, re the reality is if you look all, all the career of Martin, you'll see that um, it's not linear. I mean, there's, you, you always have a, a different approach according to the projects you're embarking and you, and you really um, work differently um, and the techniques are important because you pick them up according to what you want to achieve every time. And that's something that people that just have the superficial uh, approach to your work don't necessarily understand mm -hmm. is the... Um, the, the, on the length, how much your work has evolved. Do you, do you think today you are as um, critical of the um, eccentricity of the society as you were before? Uh, I mean, w the good thing about my relationship to the UK is uh, I it's full of contradictions. Uh, I mean, I think that tension that I have, it, it's almost like a therapeutic thing because you know, I, I, we all love our own country, you know, however bad it is. Uh, there's this funny thing that we always protect it and, and love it. And at the same time, I, I can be very critical of the Brits, especially, uh, you know, I, I'm appalled by Brexit. And, uh, you know, uh, we were forced into this. I don't know a single person who actually voted for Brexit, and yet we did, you know, and it's been a total nightmare. And we all know that it's an absolute disaster. The politicians, even the opposition party, cannot actually admit that, you know, even though you know, the economy's gone down, our foundation, we have problems posting things to Europe. It's a total nightmare. And, and that's one of the things I'm really angry about, that uh, all my fellow compatriots voted for Brexit. So when I'm out photographing, it is like a form of therapy. You know, the things that I love, I like Radio 4, I like, you know, cups of tea, things that you don't get in France. And I'm, you know, there are things, there's bigotry and snobbism and and, and, and the Brexiteers in England and Britain that I dislike. So it's tension, you know, and that tension is a healthy thing for photographers, I think. But though you say this, I'm surprised because, I mean, France has been supporting you quite a few. You got, the quite, you got assignments to work uh, when they were building the Channel Tunnel. You got uh, uh, quite a few grants in France, exhibitions, 
uh, prints were bought and sell. Though your book sells very well here. You always have a French publisher along with the English publi publisher. Um, how come you never um, published a book about French ex eccentricity <laughs> or <laughs> snobbism or whatever you would find um, characteristic of our nation? Uh, I mean, the first thing to say is, yes, I, I'm much better known in France than I, I'm in England. And, uh, you know, I've had many more shows in Paris than I've ever had in London. When I have a show here, people will review it. You're uh, like Woody Allen. <laughs> well, no, because I'm not a, you know, I haven't got the dodgy side of Woody Allen. So I don't think I'm really like him. But so that's important. But the thing is, I, I cannot speak French. I'm linguistically hopeless. Uh, oh, we're very I, good at English now. Yes, no, I've learned English. It's fine. I can get through with that. But, you know, I think really to enjoy and understand, uh, you know, the, the fabric of French life, you'd have to speak the language. And the other thing is, there is still this issue with photographing people in France. You know, obviously, if you're going in and doing a portrait, you can ask for consent, even if you don't have it signed. But generally speaking, you know, I, 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 when I did my Paris book, I was very worried that there'd be someone coming along trying to sue us, because when those new laws in France were first employed, there were a lot of people putting cases against magnum photographers. So I'm quite happy just sort of uh, staying in the UK well, it's and coming over it's here. It's basically our lawyers who were very bad at defending <laughs> right. photographers. But yeah. So that's really why I would never really consider, beyond doing something about Paris, uh, to do a book about the French uh, uh, bourgeoisie, whatever you want to call them. I, I will challenge you on that one of these days. <laughs> I, I think it's an interesting project. What are you working on at the moment? I, I, I understand. Maybe you should tell us a bit about more about the foundation. I understand, which is a very generous action of yours. Mm -hmm. um, if I understand well, you sold your book collections to the Tate Modern and from that, you invested into creating this foundation in Bristol, where you live. Um, what, what, what was your um, option in creating this foundation um, for British photographers and also sitting it in Bristol and not in London? Uh, well, first off, uh, you know, I'm a great believer in British documentary photography. I think it's very underrated. We don't have the same generosity from the from from the art world towards photography that uh, France enjoys. So, you know, it means that many of my photographer friends who are very good haven't really been able to sell prints or have a, you know, a career. I've been very lucky, I acknowledge that. So, I've been able to reinvest some of the money that I'd earned uh, and by buying and acquiring prints from my sort of peer group. Uh, and then I decided to make this more of a formal thing and in and in 19 uh, and in 2017, we finally got this building, which we bought through the foundation and kitted it out. And we now have the foundation up and running. We do four shows a year. We have a very good bookshop. Uh, we do talks. Uh, we do seminars. And uh, it, it, for me, it's, it is going to be part of my legacy. And I'm very happy to have uh, got it going. I've also, of course, the uh, archive of my own work is preserved within the foundation. And, uh, you know, this is a thing that many photographers don't really get around to thinking about. What's going to happen to their work when, they, when, they, you know, when they're dead, basically? Is it going to be sold? Who's gonna, is it going to be put in a skip? You know, so I didn't want to lumber. We only have one daughter. I didn't want to lumber her with the task of having to sort out this whole thing. And uh, it, it's been a great success. We have a wonderful membership. Uh, you know, our talks are very well frequented. And people like your good self come. And we have a great library. We have all the magazines from photography. We have Picture Post. We have Creative Camera. We have 10.8. And so we want to really make it a research uh, sort of center as well for British photography, where people can come and look at prints, look at books, look at magazines, and learn more about the history of British photography. Talking about British photography, I mean, you always claim that... Uh, you, you were kind enough to say that Henri Cartier Bresson was one of your studies uh, on your study lists when you were a student in Manchester. But um, you always said that Tony Ray Jones was the most influential for you. Um, how much do you think you followed the tracks of Tony Ray Jones? Yeah, so Tony Ray Jones was a, is a brilliant photographer who did in the late, late 60s an incredible amount of work in the UK. And it was published as a book, I think, just after his death. He died very young at the age of 30 in uh, something like, uh, I don't know, when was it, 1982, something like that. Anyway, I bought this book. Uh, someone called, someone had visited uh, the Manchester Polytechnic while I was studying photography to talk about Tony Jones, and immediately I was taken in by this work. And I guess if there's one photographer I've tried to follow, it would be him. And we've now collected uh, 
work by him, vintage prints. Uh, I went through his whole contact prints and found new pictures, which also got published and shown in London. So yes, uh, I'm very friendly with Anna Ray Jones, his widow, who is still alive and well. So he's all part of the sort of people uh, and photographers that not only have inspired me, but that we try and collect and, and how he's in our foundation too. Is the role of the foundation also to um, project this kind of work abroad f from England? Um, I, I guess our priority is really to show it in the UK. I mean, we haven't really got the staff or the inclination to go around and try and tour these exhibitions. If anyone ever sees one and wanted to take it, we'd obviously work out a way of doing that. But no, it's not our priority. Because so are you saying that the foundation is about British photographers, that you don't send exhibitions abroad? Um, and, and uh, also uh, photographers. And that, and, that, and that sounds like very much like Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you could look at it like that. But also we, we I'm collect... Asking. Well, let me finish. We also <laughs> collect uh, <laughs> images taken by foreign photographers in the UK. I mean, in a sense, uh, y you know, you have to do limitations. Otherwise, you can't do everything. So, you know, with photographic books, you know, I go around Paris Photo. I saw all these books which are interesting, but before, when I was really building up the collection, I would have to buy them, you know, because they'd be part of the collection. Now I can just bypass them all. I can look at them and get inspired and see that's a good book. And if it's exceptional, I would consider buying it. But other than that, we just have to limit ourselves because it's, it's just too much to try and take on the whole world. It's like, you, you know, you're limited to the work of Cartier-Bresson, but that's not a problem, is it? Uh, no, but we just show him in Rabat, Morocco, and mm -hmm. Taipei, and other places. That's why we're, we're we are about. Got yeah. the, we and, and and Henri said from the day one that the place in Paris should be for other photographers prior to his work. So likewise, uh, my foundation. You know, I've only done one. No, we show. have a lot of similarity. I've yeah. only done one show of my own work. Although we're doing the second one uh, next year, in fact. What will it be? And we hope to have the. Um, uh, your the Cartier Bresson reconciliation show come to us. We love. Uh, what, what will be your show next year? It's a, a new book I've just published called Chew Stoke. Uh, so in 1992, uh, I was commissioned by the Telegraph magazine to spend a year photographing and documenting one village. And this village, it was like uh, 12 kilometers from uh, Bristol, so I could go to it very easily. And uh, we had a writer who was very good I'd worked with before. And we would go there regularly, and I would photograph every event, did lots of portraits. You know, so by the end of the year, I could almost knock on any house, and, and people would sort of welcome you in. Uh, and this work uh, was published in a magazine. We had an exhibition in the village hall, and uh, people came the, the day before it was published. We gave everyone a free magazine, and uh, it was a great event. And recently, we've just done another slideshow in the village hall to introduce the book. We sold the book. So, in fact, there's a talk this afternoon at Paris Photo about you, Stoke, and then a book signing at uh, uh, Clementine de la Faria uh, Gallery in Paris Photo about four o'clock, something like that. I, I must say you've been one of the uh, first photographers to uh, go beyond just taking pictures. I mean, you had pictures in the streets of London, in the subway, m before many did so, um, and you always uh, interacted, did this kind of... Uh, Shows on beaches, which you saw. Shows on beaches, on mm -hmm. the M1, on the table of the mm -hmm. cafeterias, uh, when people stop to have a cup of coffee driving up the north or, or south, whichever. Um, so you've been very... Um, uh, well, uh, I'm very keen on keen. this dif different ways of getting photography out into society. No, absolutely. Yeah. Do, you still, do you still collect postcards? Not really, no. Because I guess my postcard collecting has... Um, you know, I've got to where I've got to, and I don't really need any more. <laughs> yeah, I've got other priorities now. Okay. Well, uh, but we're, we're going to go to questions in the room, if you um, have any, or if someone wants to be the first one, usually there's more afterwards. But we have a microphone somewhere. Yeah, we're here we have a microphone. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, we we'll take, we'll like take the opportunity to thank your team that worked with our team and did a great job in uh, getting these shows together uh, on time. And... Uh, Sharp enough. Yes, we have a question down here. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Je parle pas très bien anglais, donc est-ce que vous pourriez répéter en français où est la fondation et est-ce que c'est ouvert? Merci. Oui, bien sûr. Je suis désolé, mais on, on avait annoncé que le, le, le débat serait en, en, en anglais, donc je me doutais qu'il y aurait un peu de, de, mal, de, de difficulté à comprendre pour certains qui, qui seraient peut-être échappés. Pardon pour ça. 
euh, la fondation est à Bristol, dans, dans un quartier industriel. Uh, the question is, where is the foundation? Because uh, the lady doesn't speak English enough. Yeah. She, she missed that. Um, the if people can join, uh, subscribe, and get the newsletter of what we're doing, free of charge, of course. <laughs> and, and we have a very good bookshop full of all those Martin Parr books, <laughs> all signed, sadly all signed, but available. Donc la fondation est à Bristol, dans un quartier industriel très, où ils fabriquaient de la peinture avant. Et donc tous les bâtiments sont peints de haut en couleur. Et juste en face, il y a le, la, la, la Royal, Royal Photographic Society euh, anglaise qui a déménagé de Bath, ce qui était un peu plus loin que Bristol, jusqu'à Bristol. Donc ils sont face à face. Donc c'est un voyage qui vaut la peine d'une part parce que toutes ces villes sont merveilleuses. Et, et, et que le, là, vous avez une, un quartier photographique en train de se construire. Euh, Oh, depuis longtemps. Absolument. Oui, oui. Que vous pouvez vous inscrire sur sa mail list et commander ses livres signés en direct. Et, et qui a également. Il y a aussi quite a few films uh, about the work of Martin on, on his uh, site. Uh, quite a few funny films oh, yeah. as well. We also actually. have yeah. a, a series of interviews that I do uh, on a couch. Uh, it's on YouTube. You go to Martin Parr Foundation Sofa Sessions. We have like 23, 24 at the moment. Interviews, 20 minutes long, not too long. But you have a shrink with you? Or? Ah, no. <laughs> so if anyone's interested in, in hearing about uh, you know, famous British photographers, this is a great opportunity. Oh, no, it's not about your frustration as a kid on the beach. No, no, no okay. that's, uh, I save that for talks. <laughs> Uh, another question? Another question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Over there. Yeah, thank uh, you. You were saying that you never made um, a book about uh, French people in Paris because um, of some issues with the consent that you need to ask people if uh, they are okay to be taken mm -hmm. picture of, etc. And you said that's different in uh, England, but uh, w why don't you need <laughs> to ask their cons consent there? And because in most of your photos, it almost looks like uh, you're invisible, like as a photographer, that you can penetrate everywhere between people and uh, they seem pretty fine with it and they don't pay attention. So I was just, for me, it was so fascinating and surprising. So that's why I wanted to ask okay. how it was actually happening. Uh, so first off, uh, I mean, in the UK, you can still photograph anyone on the street and do anything you like with it apart from advertising uh, completely legally. You cannot do that in France. You know, you, 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 if someone could complain uh, and say, you know, you, you, I didn't give you consent and potentially try and sue the photographer. I, I don't know if this happens much. What do you think? There's a lot to say about this. Um, th th in France, the problem came when Robert Duano has, I, I, I knew Robert Duano pretty well when that happened. And when Robert Duano al al allowed people to think there were all the people kissing in front of the Hotel de Ville. Um, and, and people, the three, pe three people that started to claim they want a share of what Duano has earned with that picture all his life, three people, the three different people. Though Duano pretty well knew that, and because he did, he did the picture, that these were models taken And it's actually, if you look at the contact sheets, they go back and forth, back and forth, back, back and forth, till it till has the right picture. But he, he um, Duano has a great sense of humor, and he enjoyed the idea that everyone would recognize itself till, till the time it became a problem. And so everyone seeing himself or herself on the picture would start to claim in co at court. And unfortunately, um, we had very bad lawyers who were not at all prepared to fight this, and, and uh, many cases were lost, or even worse, before it went to court, the magazines in which the pictures would be published would pay whatever money for not going to court. And that yeah. created a French specificity that all photographers now I think it's dangerous to take pictures in France. It's not true, um, but it's a rumor. And, and, and there's been some cases lost by photographers, that's true, but it's not a kind of a tsunami about it. So there's more rumor, there's more fuzz about it than reality, and it's really French-specific. But one question I want to ask you is also that Henri Cartier-Bresson um, was hiding himself not to be recognized by people he would photograph. That's not the case at all. I mean, um, and, and you're now a very serious guy because uh, Our Lady, the Queen, 
um, has made you uh, officer or commander of the British Empire. So <laughs> how come you're not a celebrity? How come people, um, <laughs> what's your relationship with people? Do they recognize you in the street? Uh, occasionally. Let, let me first finish the question from this lady here. Uh, I mean, I, I have a technique of photographing on the street. It's very difficult for me to describe, but I don't face, you know, if there's someone I'm interested in photographing, I'm not, my body isn't facing them. And I we might swing around, take the picture, and then often that's with flash, so people might notice. And then uh, someone will look up, and because I'm not looking at them, uh, and most people, most photographers look at them looking guilty, okay? So I don't actually look guilty. I'm looking at something else. So that's a technique uh, that I've sort of learned to, to play with over the years. So it's, it's always been very beneficial to me. And now what was your question? Sorry, I just... No, I admire that you take pictures without looking at the, uh, your subject. I mean, it's, it's yeah, even no, I do look at the subject. I'm just swinging around quickly. <laughs> it's, it's the body language that really counts. That's how you can help to sort of camouflage what you're doing. No, my question was about celebrity. I mean, oh, yes. Uh, b b b no, I do that, get... That thing that Henri feared to be recognised... Right. Now, I guess if I go out shooting, two or three people a day might uh, come and say hello. And they're usually other photographers. You know, <laughs> the, the general public have no real interest. They might get angry, by the way, because one of the things that does happen is people do confront you. And they say, oh, it's illegal to take my picture, which it isn't, of course. Uh, and the great thing about digital now, you know, I could show them a frame. And if it's a useless frame, which most of them are, because most of the time I'm taking very bad pictures waiting for the good ones to finally emerge, I'll just delete it uh, and move on, because there's plenty more fish in the sea, <laughs> as they say. Une autre question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, um, over there? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Where are you? Wave. I'm uh, here. Uh, on the right hand side. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, the question was, I'm, I'm very curious about, uh, in the last 10 years, 15 years, with the iPhones coming up, people have become more accustomed to getting photographed or, I don't know, being, being the subject of a photograph. Uh, in your career, what do you think, like, these 10 years ha have changed for you, photographing that subject? And how do you feel the subject is changing through, through time as we get used to, to, to photographs? I, I think the uh, introduction of the smartphone has probably been the biggest change in society that I've witnessed in the last 20 years. You know, we're always, always on them now. You know, selfies, of course. I've done a book about people doing selfies because I thought it was such an interesting thing. Selfie sticks seem to be in decline. They sort of, is that right? Would you think that? Yeah. yeah, they've had their moment. It's it's going down. So things like that really, I like ephemeral ideas. You know, that really amuses me. But I think the, you know, the, the quality of the smartphone is, is remarkable. And, for example, you can, if you want to photograph on the street uh, with a smartphone, you can just look at the viewfinder down there it, you know, much less suspicious. And as the quality gets better and better, there may well come a day where I'll just duck, ditch my DSLR uh, and go to the smartphone. But I still want to make a print that's a meter by a meter and a half size, you know, l like you'll see um, uh, at the Parry Photo, for example. And uh, to do that, you really do need a big file. So you can't quite yet do that with an iPhone, but soon it'll happen, I think. It'll happen, yes, probably. Yes, yeah. it's just around the corner. We're going to go for a last question, if you have one. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question. Where, yes, so where are you? Can I'm you here. I'm over here at the back. Here, oh, yeah. I've got two hands up, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, over there. No worries. Yes, so, so we'll take you afterwards, and then we'll stop. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yes, so in Britain's a bit of a, a bit of a mess at the minute. You've got like, financial crisis, Brexit, political sh storms everywhere, potentially Scottish independence. <laughs> do, do you still have other stories you still want to tell? About uh, well, it, I, I agree with you. The, the crisis in Britain is a total mess, you know all triggered by Brexit, basically, and everything since then has gone even, you know, uh, and the ridiculous Tory government, we just have that Prime Minister who is in for six weeks, as you know, who did a crazy uh, uh, sort of financial uh, reconvention that just didn't work. So, yeah, I mean, what? so will it all change? I mean, it's very difficult to actually photograph the cost of living sort of crisis, apart from going, to say, to a, a food bank or going back to sort of photographing people looking cold in their, in their sort of sitting room. Uh, so it's not the type of work that I do. I, I'm interested in the leisure pursuits of the Western world. And despite all the problems we have, that sort of thing is still going on strong. You know, I was out this summer uh, photographing and the, everything was crowded. Everything was out there. So that's really what I like to photograph. But you're absolutely right. We're in a total mess at the moment. 
which is why it's nice to be in France. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for a very interesting talk today. I've learned a lot uh, about your work and, and uh, the foundation. Um, very specific question. Uh, you have uh, one of your many exhibitions in Paris at the moment is in the Irish Cultural Centre. And I was a bit, um, we went there yesterday to have a look at it, and I was a bit puzzled by the caption under a couple of the photographs, which were taken in 1979 at the time of the Pope's visit. And you, the caption stated that it was... Um, the Pope said Mass in the Phoenix Park, but the two photographs were taken in the west of Ireland. I right, believe. so that's, that's obviously a mistake we need to rectify. I'm sorry about that. Apologies. But yes, the, the introductory picture, I believe, is, is Phoenix Park, and then there are two pictures from Knock, which I also went to, and uh, they're obviously being miscaptioned. Please accept my apologies. <laughs> <coughs> I'm glad you to see you're on the case with details. This is well observed. At least the captions were big enough you could read them because it's not <laughs> always the case in the museum. So. Uh, and thank you for the plug for the Irish show. Please go and see it. It's on at the Irish Cultural Centre. And uh, it, it's uh, the book that accompanies it, which is nearly sold out. They still have some at Damiani's stand. It's called From the Pope to a Flat White. The idea being that in 1979, I photographed the Pope visiting Ireland. At that point, two-thirds of the Irish population went to see the Pope. Catholicism has really declined, and now, because of the uh, internet sort of companies that have their European quarters headquarters in Dublin, it's become a very gentrified city, it's become a wealthy country, and uh, if you like, a flat white is the personification of gentrification. So in between those two dates, 2019 and 1979, I've frequently gone back to Ireland, and the pictures in the exhibition show different stages of its transformation and it's difficult to imagine a country that's changed more in the last 40 years than Ireland. I mean, now you have you had a gay tea shock, I prime minister, you can have uh, abortion, you have gay weddings. I mean, it would be impossible to think of that back in the 80s, for example. It doesn't that's rain actually, anymore? No, it still <laughs> rains. No, that's one thing that hasn't changed at all, is the weather. But, you know, in, in our global well, world... That's a good par yeah. picture, right? Well, no, but I'm saying you know, the countries like uh, Britain and Ireland that have lots of rain, we're going to be the new superpowers because uh, everywhere else is going to run out of water, <laughs> even in France this year, this That's summer. Well, don't tell China. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, um, we, we're going to stop here this conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for taking the time. We're going to move... Um,